Okay, great. So basically, um, today, as a continuation a bit of um, Tuesday's uh, webinar, I've suggested the, the topic, uh, which is Putinization of Ukraine uh, and the possibility of the UN Security Council reform. I think that uh, could be interest interesting to a lot of lawyers from your faculty and a lot of political scholars and international relations theorists. Uh, so uh, on this basis, uh, I this presentation will explain what I mean by Putinization. It will uh, describe the situation of women and children during the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine. And um, I will uh, touch upon certain crimes committed by uh, Russian troops predominantly, um, and uh, we'll discuss uh, the possibility of reform of UN Security Council in order to bring certain individuals, perpetrators of these crimes to uh, justice. And uh, I'd like to thank organizing committee for uh, this opportunity for me to present in front of you, uh, I pro uh, Professor Goran Ilik and Professor Mladen uh, Karadzowski and all of the students and, and the faculty members of law department and political science department, I, I suppose. So thank you much for that. And um, as we all know, this year has been quite specific for Eastern Europe and Ukraine in particular. Um, Ukrainian people, the civilians, uh, pay quite heavy price for uh, Putin's imperial ambitions uh, and the latest unprovoked and brutal uh, war in Ukraine that started in February 2022 uh, is just escalating. Around 12 and a half million people have been forced to leave their homes. Some of them uh, left the country, like 7 million approximately, and the rest uh, are considered uh, as internally displaced. Uh, this is very similar to what was happening in Syria between 2011 and 2012, 2013, and very similar to what was happening in the Balkans back uh, in the 1990s, not to mention the Second World War. But we, we all um, have access to internet, to social media, to, uh, to um, international broadcasters. Some of us follow certain events uh, by switching to Ukrainian medias. Uh, we also try to access some Russian media just at, as a point of comparison, because uh, let's be honest, there's a propaganda war as well. So both sides are um, trying to manipulate certain truths uh, in order to uh, weaponize the information in order to achieve certain political objectives and goals. Um, what I want to focus today is the basically first 200 days of, of the war and its impact on the global structure of power and the legal system, the global legal system. So uh, in the uh, direct uh, preparations of the Battle of Kiev back in uh, February, March, um, Russia has been quite uh, active in um, unleashing various hostilities towards uh, civilians in, in in Ukraine, especially in the uh, eastern part of, uh, of the country, southern and uh, Kiev region in the northeast, basically. Um, and uh, it is argued in this presentation that um, Russia unleashed uh, a dreadful campaign which can be um, compared to the um, Balkan type of ethnic cleansing against the of the civilian populations in in the um, in the country to uh, basically generate a lot of fear and uh, demobilize uh, Ukrainian people from from resisting. As we know now, uh, in November two thousand twenty-two, the situation is totally different because it is Ukraine who is on on the offensive and it is. Russia, who is trying to uh, defend the territories which are under its occupation. But back then, um, we anticipated the political uh, theories that uh, Ukraine will not uh, be able to defend itself so effectively, because back then they didn't get the support from the West and they were trying to do their best with, with their own means, basically. Um, 
in March, in April, and in uh, May, as well as in June 2022, a lot of atrocities came to light. Like, for instance, in Bucha, in Irpin, in Hostomol, in Izum, Kherson, and Mariupol, a lot of crimes, evidence, uh, massacres, and uh, mistreatments of local populations in Ukraine came to light. Uh, we are basically uh, living in the 21st century, so it is easier to send the information about certain crimes uh, to global uh, domain and, and a lot of a lot of information who uh, that, that we have access to comes uh, from basically first hand. Uh, some witnesses uh, took some pictures or a drone was sent in the area of operation and thanks to that, uh, we have evidence, some forensic evidence of certain atrocities happening. Like for instance, in Bucha, that's that's one of the most dreadful uh, case of 410 people being slaughtered, uh, like unfortunately, like animals. As a matter of fact, it's um, in Mariupol. Um, in in March, also the bombing of the Opera House resulted in uh, it's in 600 innocent civilians uh, death and uh, from what we know from the information which we which we gathered the attacks on the Mariupol uh, Opera House was pretty much premeditated despite of the fact that there was a clear sign of uh, in front of the Opera House suggesting that there are children uh, in this uh, what was uh, changed to shelter the uh, Russian a military decided to uh, drop two 500 kilograms uh, bombs on, on, on the Opera House and that resulted in 600 uh, lives, um, the departure of 600 people and approximately another 1,000 um, uh, injured. Um, what we know from previous conflicts, not only from the conflict in Ukraine, is the fact that uh, dealing with the post-traumatic stress disorder will not be easy, especially for children and the women uh, who are subjected to various forms of abuse by uh, by the uh, intervening forces. So um, um, we may expect that the traumatic experiences that happened back then in March, um, April and May um, have had an impact on the on the civilian populations and the, um, the whole Ukraine, basically, and, and shocked shocked the whole world. And the, the goal was to traumatize people so they wouldn't resist. But instead, what uh, Putin and his generals achieved is actually the opposite effect, because Ukrainians started to defend themselves more effectively, and they, they saw that they have no choice but to defend themselves. Uh, the scale of the, not only the uh, civilian lives, but the scale of the infrastructure dim damage, the, the civilian populations um, basically is, is unim unimaginable. What, what, what is happening in, in, in Ukraine up to this very day uh, in eastern, southern and northern, northern parts is basically massive uh, scale of the destruction and uh, in the modern conflict, um, in the contemporary conflict, uh, the uh, parties that uh, take part in the conflict should uh, make a clear distinction between military targets and civilian targets. But uh, as we know from, as as we see from hundreds of pictures circulating on social media, and uh, uh, as we see from the uh, media reports, uh, um, Putin and and his generals don't discriminate between. Uh, military and civilian targets. They just they just target um, indiscriminately Ukraine in order to break the spirit of resistance. Um, many scholars, many of my colleagues, uh, use such terms of, as balkanization of the situation in Eastern Europe and balkanization of the uh, of the situation in Ukraine. From my perspective, this term is totally inapplicable because. What has been happen ha happening in, in, in the Balkans for the last 25, 30 years is completely opposite. And the, the term Balkanization is, uh, is irrelevant from my perspective. 
Um, the same uh, applies to the term Finlandiz Finlandization because Finlandization was the term which was used in order to describe the um, uh, political party, the, the uh, political actor uh, that would be uh, independent internally but it would be uh, externally um, uh, under the full um, uh, full rule of the of the uh, hegemon the, and and basically what finalization worked uh, for uh, the entire uh, cold war uh, finland decided to just abandon its foreign policy and and uh, remained independent intern internally but um, given that uh, finland has just uh, asked to join nato and this term also uh, is not as applicable as it could be and uh, very often in the lead up to february 2022 uh, politicians such as emmanuel macron uh, suggested for ukraine to embrace such uh, idea of finlandization maybe you can um, give up uh, give some uh, concessions to russia and preserve its territorial integrity as we know that was a total uh, failure on the uh, on the um, President Macron's um, suggestion, but but uh, this is not the main topic of the conversation. What I want to introduce you, I want to introduce you to the uh, social uh, socio political term of Putinization, which I've coined recently. Uh, from my perspective, this is a situation if if any given country um, would would be explained as both official and unofficial attempts of the Russian Federation aimed at restoring Russian domination and hegemony in Eastern Europe, Asia, at any cost by instigating an unprecedented, unpredictable and uncontrollable series of vicious events and war crimes, most likely producing a river of little cutting massacres as we have already witnessed in Ukraine, aimed at intimidating local populations across Eastern Europe and Central Asia to cause an ultimate disintegration of the broader political unit and its abrupt replacement with several political units and the subsequent annexation of these territories into the Russian Federation under the false pretense of the alleged pre-existence of some previously unspecified and unverifiable political will to join Russian Federation declared by the alleged majority of Russian speaking people inhabiting these territories. So this is a time which I uh, recently uh, introduced and, and it will be published within a couple of basically days. Um, what I want to suggest is that in the lead up, how to explain it, in, in the lead up to, uh, in the direct aftermath of the um, Bucha massacre, the Slovenian Prime Minister uh, Janes uh, Janza compared killings uh, in Bucha to cutting massacre on, of 1940s. And uh, I just want to um, uh, give some uh, broader um, account to this to this suggestion because uh, cutting massacre uh, it is suggested that uh, those events had genocidal character which which we could agree to. Um, genocide uh, is basically understood as intentional destruction of people usually defined as an ethnic, national, racial or religious group in whole or in part and this, this term was coined in, uh, at the end of the Second World War uh, by uh, Raphael Lemkin and ever since it was widely used to describe uh, the atrocities committed on uh, populations uh, under certain um, dominance of, of certain hegemon basically um, the problem is that with, the, with with cutting massacre the scale of cutting massacre was much higher there was like more than 22,000 Polish military officers murdered by Soviets uh, police and NKVD uh, back in 1940 1941 uh, and if we compare this with 410 people uh, killed you cannot compare uh, pears and apples or pears and uh, and uh, oranges basically um, what could work uh, when it comes to com certain comparisons we could start comparing um, the events in in ukraine to um, balkan wars 
but still uh, the scale would be uh, totally different let's say um, up to this very day and there is many uh, leaders former leaders of uh, former Yugoslavian states who are brought to justice or tried to be to, uh, brought to justice um, because they were guilty of certain war crimes and these war crimes have been committed on both sides basically um, and genocide involves the, 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 the terminology that's uh, the, the, the very um, the, ref, the very definition suggests that the, there is a systematic killing of racial or cultural groups such as Nazi genocide of Jews uh, in uh, Germany or in po uh, occupied territories of Poland because of uh, Nazi Germany or Austria Austrian um, crimes committed during this this particular period um, genocide involves always the systematic killing of racial or cultural group and the synonymous of genocide is a uh, race mur murder or racial extermination uh, for instance, Srebrenica uh, massacre is very often uh, suggested to be a genocide or, or that was a genocide. But again, some people, some some countries uh, decide to question the, the term genocide. Um, very often we use genocide to describe the uh, murder, murderous campaign in Rwanda uh, and the humanizing efforts of uh, Tutsi, uh, basically, populations. Um, there are various stages of genocide, such as classification, symbolization, discrimination, dehumanization, denial, extermination, persecution, preparation and polarization. And um, in order to meet the threshold of genocide, uh, it's quite difficult to meet the threshold of genocide. Um, surely we could uh, basically draw certain analo analogies between what's happening in Ukraine and what was happening in Rwanda. For instance, in Rwanda, in order to uh, unleash this massive scale uh, um, um, of, uh, of, the, of the crimes and, and genocides, uh, um, basically uh, the radio was working in order to uh, trigger certain violence, certain hostility. Uh, Russia very often uses uh, social media uh, in order to dehumanize, dehumanize uh, Ukrainian populations. Um, but again, the scale of, the, of both of these uh, massacres or crimes is incomparable. Um, when it comes to the uh, different example of genocide, uh, some would say that Armenian ge genocide of 1915 accounts for a perfect example because uh, approximately 800,000 to 1.2 million Armenians were sent to death uh, marches to the Syrian desert in 1915 and 1916. But yet, Turkey, for instance, of course, denies uh, uh, that that was a genocide. Uh, so so um, it's difficult to, to get the international uh, recognition of, of certain uh, certain um, atrocities that are that were happening and um, surely it's not only about the numbers and not the count of the bodies uh, but um, the scale and, and the type of the of the uh, crimes committed on the civilian populations the ethnic intent to annihilate a given group from a given territories and surely um, there is a lot of efforts in uh, Russian propaganda, state propaganda, to dehumanize Ukrainians and suggest that they are pretty much the same uh, like Russians and uh, Ukrainian nationality is not, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't um, be allowed even. Um, very often uh, Russia uses uh, disinformation tactic to uh, to suggest, for instance, that it is NATO who started the whole thing and they are just following up on, on what NATO uh, started. So um, many academics in the West, uh, just like, for instance, John Merschheimer, tries to also suggest that uh, basically the West did, uh, did not uh, did, uh, put place the nose around the uh, Ukraine's neck and that's why uh, Putin decided to, to attack uh, Ukraine in February 2022. 
The problem is that uh, surely the West did not force Putin to authorize any of the atrocities that were committed in 2022. And um, this is especially true to a very secret war crime, um, genocidal rape in Ukraine that has been inflicted by certain groups, by by Russian, certain members of Russian army. Um, and this sexual violence, uh, the scale of sexual violence has been um, basically reported ever since the day one of the of the campaign. Um, the people who who are, are the victims of uh, uh, rape inflicted by Russian troops uh, range from the age of two to eighty two, which clearly shows that uh, this rape is not inflicted on the Ukrainian population only out of uh, some sort of misconstrued pleasure seeking, but uh, as a campaign which is inflicted on the population in order to dehumanize them and, and uh, destroy their will to resist. But again, when it comes to uh, the notion of rape and wartime rape, it's not only in Ukraine. And when it comes to any conflict, any global conflict or regional conflict, uh, rape is very often used in military conflict. For instance, Boko Haram uh, used certain atrocities against women in Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, as we speak, basically. Uh, the genocide of Yazidis by Islamic State uh, and the Sinjar mountain massacre in Iraq uh, is uh, basically an example of, of uh, those type of uh, crimes. The use of rape during the uh, Syrian civil war was quite uh, um, um, well reported. Uh, Rohingya people were uh, basically um, subjected to various uh, mass rapes by Ma Man Myanmar uh, army in 2016-2017. And the massive scale of sexual violence was unleashed uh, during the South uh, Sudan's uh, civil war. Uh, mass rape uh, happened during the triggery conflict in, in Ethiopia that is still uh, going on. Um, of course, a book uh, example, the, case, the, uh, the perfect example is the uh, sexual violence against Tamils in Sri Lanka. Um, so basically, when it comes to the conflict related to sexual violence, um, and um, it can be compared to, to various other crimes committed on, on uh, local populations in different uh, zones. It's just that uh, when it comes to the Russian um, use of rape as a tactic of war or as a weaponization of war, it seems, seems to be that the, the problem is more systemic. It's not individual. On the individual basis, it's more, um, there is more examples of that. And uh, as a matter of fact, Russia is a party of various anti-rape uh, legislation around the world, and even the most recent ones. Uh, between 2016 and 2019, the United Nations adopted a series of specific and very comprehensive resolutions that re reiterated that wartime rape and sexual violence constitute war crimes and genocide. And that was the UN Security Council Resolution 2286, 2417, 2474, 2475, 2573, and so on and so forth. And there's many of them. In 1993, um, after, after or during the Rwanda genocide, during, or in the, in the lead up to the Rwanda genocide, United Nations uh, Commission of Human Rights also recommended treating system, syst systemic rape and military sexual slavery as crimes against humanity. So uh, surely uh, this is against the just war theory and Russian military servicemen and the generals are very well aware of what just war theory is. And they are also aware what Genev Geneva Conventions are and what the core principles of international humanitarian law uh, suggest. So when it comes to the uh, international obligations of, of Russian Federation, Russia is not only aware of them, Russia is a, should be a pillar of uh, the party which should protect others from unleashing certain crimes on uh, civilians. 
as a UN Security Parliament 5 member state, uh, it should be doing its very best to protect global peace and security, peaceful resolution of conflicts and negotiate uh, at the negotiation tables, and most certainly, not embrace embrace the opposite of these policies. So, in theory, Russia has international legal obligation to uh, impartially investigate alleged war crimes by its soldiers at all times, even when there was only, uh, if, if, even if there is only an allegation of that. But in practice. Um, not only that Russia tolerates that, uh, but the same uh, military unit which was responsible for unleashing uh, horrible crimes against uh, residents of Bucha was recently awarded uh, some military recognition by Putin in, in the defense of the state or something similarly um, um, irrational basically. Uh, and Russia, it seems that Russia uses sexual violence uh, as a tactic of war and it weaponizes rape. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, to what extent, because we don't have the data to, to basically to uh, suggest which groups are responsible for, for those type of crimes. As a matter of fact, the cadre of brigades um, happened to be in the Bucha region back in March and April um, and uh, Russia used uh, Chechens or Chechen threats to to intimidate the local populations. I'm not pointing fingers to this group but uh, the Chechens, the cadre of brigades have been uh, accused of certain um, crimes against uh, civilians in different uh, conflict zones. The Wagner Group uh, is just a, a military company that acts as an informal uh, and um, unofficial unit of Russian army and very often in previous conflicts uh, in Syria um, uh, basically or in Georgia the Wagner Group uh, committed certain crimes, certain war crimes uh, so in the future investigation of these crimes, I suppose that it's not only Russian army that would have to be looked into and, and the certain behaviors of individual uh, members of, of this uh, organization, but also the paramilitary organizations serving under the Russian army under broader umbrella. Uh, when it comes to the crime and potential punishment of the head of state of a uh, a United Nations Security Council permanent member, we have a little bit of problem. Because Russia, Russian Federation happens to be not only the UN Security Council permanent five member, but also it happens to have a lot of nuclear weapons. So bringing to justice Russia or Russian leader um, could be quite tricky, let's say. Um, and uh, yes, of course, it was Russia of uh, President Boris Yeltsin who recognized U Ukraine as independent country in Belovesh Accords and then in Budapest Memorandum uh, promised Ukraine peace and security if, it, uh, if this country decided to abandon its nuclear weapons. And that's what they did. The, uh, Ukraine joined the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty, but ever since uh, that, Russia of President Vladimir Putin decided to uh, change everything, uh, deny that um, piece by piece. Um, the, bot the bottom line is that without the harsh punishment of the perpetrators of certain crimes committed in Ukraine, any future Russian leader is likely to resort to the same strategy of Putinization and apply it against the, any peaceful nation in the future. So even if we, even if Putin, um, for instance, uh, is uh, out of power for any reason, his successor might be inclined to uh, apply the same type of strategy simply because it's it's been rewarding for Russia ever since let's say 1945, because not even in Nuremberg, uh, no one decided to uh, question Soviet Union. Uh, on uh, no, no one decided to just uh, even ask the question what, what's happening with the, with the crimes committed against the 
um, Russian people during the uh, Second World War and after after um, after that in 1945. But that's that's the other issue here. Bringing Putin to justice um, v will be very tricky and uh, because uh, going to uh, in order to uh, practically speaking from legal perspective in order to do so uh, in order to make sure that the crimes uh, in Ukraine um, um, will uh, face the people who committed these crimes will face justice uh, we would have to basically reform the UN Security Council because whatever we decide now uh, Russia or Vladimir Putin will veto uh, any resolution um, suggested by by uh, any UN security uh, any UN member as a matter of fact so um, the likelihood of changing UN Security Council is would be possible uh, perhaps after the third world war or a massive nuclear disaster uh, so Yes, uh, even if the US, France, China and Britain decides to come together and reform the UN Security Council, Russia can still um, basically uh, say no to that. So what could work, um, and I'm not saying that that's something which could be implemented now, but maybe in the future, is some sort of Putin legs. Uh, reforming uh, UN Security Council. The suggestion uh, that UN Security Council permanent member state who actively engage in a military campaign against an independent country automatically loses their place at the UN Sec Security Con Council table until an independent international tribunal clears them of the charge of the vo 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 uh, vo violation of the principle of state sovereignty they committed themselves to protect or for a minimum of period of 25 years. Because if um, if Russia was out from UN Security Council, then other countries, or four of them, or, or another uh, one which would be replaced, uh, which would be replacing uh, Russia, would uh, be able to um, start some legal procedures against the uh, Russian authorities uh, or force them to, to exped expedite uh, these uh, people who are responsible for certain crimes. There is one 193 members of, of General Assembly, uh, five members of Parliament uh, UN Security Council and ten non parliament So uh, the other option is to uh, get rid of Security Council altogether, but that's, uh, that's also a political science fiction theory. Um, that is why today let's talk about possibilities and the possibility is to start dialogue about certain changes. If we create some sort of consortium and the um, gathered um, consortium of universities, non-profit organizations, colleges uh, and uh, non-profit organizations that will uh, organize a trial in absentia of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, uh, we can uh, expedite the process because we can um, teach our students uh, how the legal system of the future, not UN-based security system, but the future um, legal global security system should work. Um, Putin uh, hypothetically speaking, could be brought to justice for crimes committed in Georgia, Syria, Ukraine and against the Russian people. So my suggestion to you today is how about if we come together and start a proceeding of a trial in absentia of Mr. Putin. Um, basically, um, there is a couple of uh, suggestions of my um, future publications which I could uh, suggest to, to you if you if you're interested in this topic forever uh, surely the the publication which I already uh, suggested uh, the Putinization of the of the uh, situation of uh, women and children during the 2020 uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine this is a paper which comprises all of these ideas which I which I talked about today 
Another one is a comparative study of Russia's war in Ukraine um, and and uh, it, uh, Georgia and Syria. Um, how a perfectly winnable, winnable up, uh, uprising has been transformed into a uh, civil war in Russia is also quite relevant because the cases of Bashar al-Assad and, uh, and Vladimir Putin are very much uh, similar because Bashar al-Assad never faced uh, justice for crimes committed in Syria thanks to his good friend Vladimir Putin and that's not how the UN security system should work in my opinion. So thank you much for your attention and I welcome any questions you might have.